Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you would turn with me, please, to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 20, is where we will begin our dialogue with my sons, a series of messages, not to try to replace uh, the fathers that are operating in their children's lives. We know that there are millions of fathers uh, who are in the home with their children, love their wife and two parent households taking care of their children. There are hundreds of thousands of fathers who have sole custody of their children. Uh, these black fathers who, who's, who are right there providing for and teaching and training and nurturing. And then there are millions of fathers who don't have custody of their children, but still in their children's lives and there for their sons and, and love them and care for them and, and, and providing in a way that that boy can go from boy to be a man. So I'm not trying to take your place. I am trying to come alongside you and help you to understand uh, some of the things that we could say and should say uh, in order to minister to our sons. But for those boys and for those young men whose fathers never spoke to you, never conversed to you about anything positive or significant about what God is seeking to do in your life, I pray that you'll open your hearts, your mind, and your soul and just receive this, this word from Father's heart um, to God's sons and just allow God to deal with you and to use you in a way and to get you to where he wants you to be. Amen. Amen. Proverbs 1 verse 20. Wisdom shouts in the streets. That's what it says in the New Living Translation. Wisdom shouts in the streets. Let me holler at you. That's what I want to preach about or converse with you about, dialogue with you about today. Let me holler at you. There are so many things every day that are seeking to get your attention with the intention of influencing your decisions and your choices. Every day, there are 20,000 advertisements, son, that you have to come to grips with, trying to influence your attitude, your ambition, your activity, even your spending habits. There's always somebody trying to speak to you, always somebody trying to get through to you, whether it's a mother or father or grandmother or grandfather, whether it's a teacher or counselor, a professor or principal, whether it's a pastor or a minister or a bishop or an elder, a Sunday school teacher, a neighbor, a coach, there's always somebody trying to get through to you and trying to influence your attitude, your ambition, and your activity to direct your direction and to decide on your destiny for you. Whether it's a Republican or a Democrat or a Libertarian or whether it's an independent, there's always somebody trying to get through to you, whether it's a get-rich-quick scheme or a pyramid scheme at the pyramid scheme, or whether it's a drug dealer, a drug dealer or a gang banger or peer pressure or some woman that you ain't got no business being with. There's always somebody trying to get through to you, but in the midst of all of that, Solomon says that wisdom is shouting at you even in the streets. Wisdom is hollering out at you. Wisdom is seeking to get your attention. Why? Because you, you will never be successful. You will never be prosperous. You'll never get to the destiny God has for you without wisdom. Now, how do we go about this wisdom piece? Well, it all starts with God. Proverbs 1 and 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It all starts with God. So if you're going to become who God wants you to be and have all God wants you to have and accomplish all God wants you to accomplish, it's going to take wisdom. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You got to know that there is a God. You must recognize and acknowledge that God is real. When I was coming up, we had to learn to pray at an early age. At every meal, we would pray. Father, I thank you for what I'm about to receive, for the nourishment of my body. For Christ's sake, amen. I still remember it after all these years. Every night on my knees, mandated to pray, uh, instructed to pray. Now I lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, pray the Lord my soul to take. Because what 
my mother was seeking to do was to make sure I had a I was God conscious that I was conscious that there was a God somewhere so in difficulties hardships and painful times that I wouldn't turn to the wrong thing but I would call on the God that I learned how to pray to when Jesus was dying on the cross for your sins and for mine to pay the penalty for our sins, seven last sayings came out of his mouth. And one of those was, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. That was not something that Jesus just made up on the fly. That was not just something that came to his head out of the blue. Y'all, that's what Jewish parents used to teach their children like we teach ours now lay me down to sleep they taught theirs father into your hand i commit my spirit so during the most one of the most difficult times in jesus life one of the most hurtful times one of the most traumatic times in his life he was able to lean back on and call back and recall from childhood that god is a god that you can put your life in his hand and i wonder when you have no god conscious what do you fall on? What do you turn to? Where do you put your life when, when trouble comes and difficulty comes? Well, I got a God conscious. I believe God is real. And I believe God hears and answers prayer. And it is the fear of God that is the beginning of wisdom. Is recognizing that God is real. Now here's what the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1. Son, he says that none of us are without excuse. That God has given us enough evidence that everybody recognizes there's a God somewhere. Now, some of us suppress that truth. And when you suppress the truth of God, all you got left is a lie. But God says we're without excuse. Can't run around saying, I didn't know there was a God. Yes, you did. Because nature itself speaks of the fact that God exists. When you look at the sun, the moon, the stars, the trees, the grass, you look at you and me, look at the fish, the birds, and look at animals and all of that, then you know there's a God somewhere because nature speaks of that God. Nature testifies about the power of God because it took somebody with power to put all this together. And this is no accident. This is no big bang theory. This is nothing about elements and, and particles floating around in the universe and crashed into each other and got this world. No, it's too much order for this to be an accident. This speaks not only of the power of God, but the wisdom of God. That God must have wisdom. Why? Look at the order of the universe. The sun rises in the east and sets in the west. It never rises in the west and sets in the east. This earth rotates in a 24-hour period so we can keep time of day week month and year there's some order to this that's a sign that this is a god of wisdom matter of fact the sun is 93 million miles away from the earth if the sun were any closer to the earth the earth would burn up if it were any further from the earth the earth would freeze but god is a god of wisdom that put it in the right place the moon is right where it's supposed to be. The moon is what determines and dictates the flow of rivers and oceans and waters. If it were any closer to this earth, we would have tsunamis all over the place and the world would be destroyed. But God is a God of wisdom and order. If there were no gravity in this world, everything would just collapse. You have no excuse. There is a God somewhere nature speaks of this god and and then to say well i don't believe in him because i don't see him because i don't see god then i don't believe there is a god there's a lot of stuff you don't see but you know is real you don't see the wind but you know the wind is real because there's evidence that the wind exists there is an unseen reality that you cannot see it but yet there is evidence that it exists that's how god is that that no i cannot see god but i know that there's a god somewhere because there's evidence god exists it's like when i was a child my, my childhood pastor uh he would talk about that little boy that was at the park flying his kite and as he was flying his kite kite got so high he couldn't see the kite an old man walked up and said boy what you doing said i'm flying a kite old man looked up said i don't see one said yeah but i'm still flying i'm flying how you know it's there i don't see it the boy said because every now and then i feel a little tug on the string no i don't see god but every now and then 
I felt a little tug on the string of my heart. When the young man was up here ministering, when the choir sang, when folk pray, I feel a little tug on my heart because I know God is real. And it starts with God. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of God, verse 7. And this is not fear and afraid of God. God is not telling us to be frightened of him. That's not what that's saying. The fear of God. It doesn't mean that I'm scared of God. It's fear in, in the sense of reverence. The respect of God is the beginning of wisdom. The honor of God is the beginning of wisdom. A-W-E. The all of God is the beginning of wisdom. Because some of us say we believe in God, but we live like there is no God. I mean, how are you going to say in your head, I believe there's a God, but in your habits, you live like there is no God. And so the beginning of wisdom is when I reverence this God and honor this God and glorify this God and praise this God and talk to this God and listen to this God. And that's the beginning of wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. Wisdom is, is, the, is knowledge that we apply to our lives. Wisdom, wisdom is not just knowledge itself, but it's the application of the knowledge. Because if you have a certain amount of knowledge, but you don't apply it, that ain't wisdom. That's foolishness. And the fool has already said in his heart, there is no God. So it's for you to say, I, I, I have knowledge. I know the difference between right and wrong. I know the difference between good and evil. But you know what's right. You know what's true. You know what's good. But don't make the application to your life. That's not wisdom. That's foolishness. But when I have a respect of God, that's the beginning of being able to take knowledge and make the application to my life so that I can go on to the success and the prosperity and to the destiny that God has designed for me is wisdom and discipline the text says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and discipline that's what wisdom helps you with discipline and son that's why a lot of us are so messed up we have no self-discipline yeah and discipline is in the same word family as disciple Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciple, if you're going to come after me, you must first deny yourself, take up the cross. You got to have some discipline, some self-discipline if you're going to be my disciple. Well, that comes from having a reverence as to who God is. Because how can you say you believe God but won't listen to him? If you believe in this God then why won't you listen to this God? You believe in God. Then, then hear the fact he said that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That when you believe Jesus down on the cross and God raised you from the dead, you say, and now I have a relationship with this God. Now I need to listen to the God that I say exists. Because God is the one that helps me to determine what is right and wrong. How do we know in this world what's good and evil, what's right and wrong, what's the truth and a lie? Is based on what God's wisdom says in his word. So now, everything I hear, everything I listen to, the word of God is the acid test for whether or not it is true. So everybody's got something to say. Everybody got philosophies and all that. Okay, well, what do you say? Let me, let me, let me see if it coincides with the word. Because if it doesn't coincide with the word, that's a lie. It coincides with the word, it's truth. And if you suppress the truth and suppress the truth, all you got left is a lie. So I got to keep listening to God's word so I can have his wisdom to know the difference between right and wrong. You don't know what is right and wrong, what is moral and immoral based on surveys and polls. Well, a, a survey was taken and the majority of the people believe this, so it must be right. No. Uh-uh. It's based on what God says. Because something can be legal and still be immoral. Just because it's legal doesn't make it ethical. And the way we determine is not based on what our friends are saying. It's not based on what family is saying. It's not based on what is popular. It's not based on how much money I can make off of it. It is based on what God's word says. And when I live over that, that is wisdom. When God created 
Adam and Eve, he put them in the Garden of Eden, said, you can eat of every tree in the garden except one. Don't eat of it, don't touch it, leave it alone, you're going to die. The tree of good and evil. What was so significant about that tree of good and evil? That's because before Adam and Eve ate of the tree, everything God said was good, they believed it was good. Everything God said was evil, they believed it was evil. But once they ate of the fruit, God told them to leave alone. After that, everything Adam and Eve thought was good, was good. And everything Adam and Eve thought was evil, was evil, regardless of what God said. And, and it went from God knowing good and evil and determining that, to humanity trying to determine what is good and evil and we end up doing that which is evil because we think it's right in our own eyes so we have to get back to God's wisdom and get back to God's word that if God says it's wrong it's wrong if God says it's right it's right if God says it's moral it's moral if God says it's immoral it's immoral just because it's legal doesn't make it ethical there is something there's a school of thought that is called the school of thought that is called situational ethics there are those who believe that you determine what is right and wrong based on the situation you're in. So depending upon your situation, something you do something is right. If your situation changes, you can do the same thing, and this time it's wrong. Depending upon your situation. All right, son, let me do it like this. Uh, my youngest son, KJ, said that he and his friends were having an ethical conversation. They were dealing with ethics. He's, he's 15. And he said, the question came, is it okay to steal a Bible? <laughs> Situational ethics. Because God wants me to have a Bible. He wants me to have his word. I have no money to buy a Bible. But I know God wants me to have a Bible. And so if I steal this Bible, it's okay because of the situation I'm in. Situational ethics can mess you up that is it okay for a hungry man to steal food or for a husband and a father who lost his job to steal what somebody else has so he could pay his rent because God knows my heart because of the situation I'm in uh, that that situational ethics will tell you that I can have sex with this girl and move in with her even though we're not married and I can have sex with her and move in with her because we're going to get married anyway. And since we're going to get married anyway, then we can go and have sex right now because we can't afford to do it now and because of the situation and God knows my heart. Y'all, the word of God teaches us that there is absolute truth. There are some things that are absolutely wrong and other things that are absolutely right regardless of the circumstance. And I got to have enough faith and trust in God that regardless of my circumstance, God's going to take care of me. Because if God wants me to have a Bible, he don't have to steal it to get me one. That if God wants to give me food, I once was young, but now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor their seed begging bread. God is a God that provides that if my wife and my children are going without because I don't have a job I don't have to hit you upside your head and take what you work for I can go to God because my God shall supply not some of but all my needs so this wisdom this fear of God helps me to now know the difference between what is right and wrong because of what God says not situational ethics, but the truth of what God says. And in, in, verse, in verse 9, it says, and when I get this wisdom, it affects my head. The wisdom, verse 9, gets in my head. And that's important because whatever gets in my head will determine my habits. Whatever gets in my head. And then it said, wisdom is like a chain, a gold chain around somebody's neck. You know what, what a neck does for a person? It helps keep their head on straight. That's why folk with no wisdom keep losing their heads. But when I got wisdom, 
then then I'm able to discern right and wrong and what I allow to become a part of my head. That's why whatever you listen to, whatever, whatever gets in your head affects your habits. That's why, you know, just allowing young people, the kids to go and watch sinful movies with, with, with sexual situations in the movie and lying and cussing and fighting and violence and all that and somehow think it's not going to affect this nine-year-old's head. That that to allow my son to, to, to play an electronic game where, where they're blowing people up and cutting off people's heads and stealing cars and breaking out of jail and raping women and somehow think this, this, won't, this won't bother his head. If it gets in his head, it's going to affect his habits. That, that to listen to to gangster rap music and that degrades our women and our sisters and 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 cussing and violence and stupidity and all of that say well no you know i listen to gangster rap but i just like the beat i don't listen to the words your brain is not able to dissect the song like that that only the beat gets in and the words don't get in and whatever gets in affects your head because some people will say you know what jeffrey johnson you think you so holy that's why you don't listen to that no i don't listen to that because i ain't that holy because whatever gets in my unholy head is going to show up in my unholy life that's why i try to get some holiness in my head to show up in my habits We, we got to make sure that we, we're getting this thing right with God because everybody's coming at you. Peer pressures and friends and ungodly philosophies, everything's coming at you. Advertisements and drugs and pornography and gangbangers and drug dealers, everything is coming at you. That's why you got to learn how to hear God's voice because that's where your wisdom is. That's where your destiny is tied to. Uh, uh, Lady Sharon and I, in the year 2000, we went, to, we went to Baltimore to see the Baltimore Ravens play early in the season. And we also ended up going to the Super Bowl, watch the Baltimore Ravens in the Super Bowl, because one of our former members was a member of the Baltimore Ravens team, Kip Vickers, member of our church. And he was a young man. He got uh, drafted by uh, the, the Indianapolis Colts, uh, played at the University of Miami, got drafted by the Colts. But the Colts, when they drafted him, they put him on the practice squad. And then somebody get injured, they bring him up. Somebody off the injury reserve, he back on the practice squad. Back on the team, back on the practice. This went on for a minute. And then uh, all of a sudden, the Baltimore Ravens wanted Kip on their team in 2000. So Kip was excited, no more practice squad, finally making some decent money and all that. And he said, Pastor, I just want to, to show my appreciation for those who supported me when life was up and down for me. Well, he said that included Lady Sharon and I. So he flew us on to, to, to Baltimore and put us up in a hotel, had us at the game and all that kind of stuff. And that was when Tony Banks started the season as the quarterback. By the end of the year, uh, Trent Dilford, I believe, took him on and won the Super Bowl with him. But we were at the game, and, and Baltimore, they had the number one defense in the league, and they were going at it. And the crowd was loud and screaming and cheering and all of that. And after each play, I didn't notice it. Lady Sharon noticed. I didn't notice it. She would put, that the Tony Banks would put his hands over his ears on the helmet after every play. And, and, and she said, Jeffrey, what is he doing? I said, what is who doing? Him right there, the quarterback. Why does he keep putting his hands over his ears? And sure enough, next play, they advance the ball, and the crowd is screaming and hollering, and Tony Banks is not giving high fives. He's got his hands over his ears. I said, oh, baby, I know what he's doing. He's got a receiver inside his helmet. His offensive coordinator has a transmitter. And oftentimes the, the coordinators will, some of these coaches will sit up in the coach's box high above the field because they know that Tony Banks has a limited view of what's going on from the field. So the coach is able to sit up in the coach's box as the offensive coordinator and can have a panoramic view and see everything and see the lineup and the scheme of the defense and the opposition that's trying to keep him from his goal. So through the transmitter, he sends in the next play to get him to the goal. But Tony Banks can't hear the receiver in his helmet because even folk who are for him are making too much noise. 
So he has to he has to put his hands to his ear because I got to shut out all this outside noise so I can hear the coordinator send the play in to deal with the scheme of the opposition so that I can get to my goal. Listen, God is your coach and wisdom is your offensive coordinator. And God has put his spirit inside of you as a receiver to get his word. But your friends and family are making so much ungodly noise until you can't hear God. God speak so you got to shut them out because God sees things that I can't see and he can get me to where I'm trying to go let me holler at you wisdom shouts in the streets and I love that wisdom ain't just shouting shouting in the streets wisdom don't just shout at God's house wisdom shouts at your house Wisdom shouts at the crack house. Wisdom shouts at the bar house. Wisdom shouts at the whore house. He don't just, she doesn't just shout in, in, in the pews. She shouts in the public places. Don't just shout in the sanctuary. I'm so glad that there have been times I've been in a crazy situation and wisdom began to shout. You better than this. There's more to you than this. You know you ain't got no business getting in here. You need to get out of here because wisdom shouts in the street starts with God listening to him but then you got to see yourself learning son so you can't, you can't go all your life and not learn anything you see yourself learning verse 7 fear of God the Lord is the beginning of wisdom verse 8 my son listen when your father corrects you don't neglect your mother's instruction and what you learn is going to impact your head. You got to see yourself learning. And I know it says, listen to instructions of father, listen to instructions of mother. And some of us, our mothers and fathers gave us no instruction. Well, God has given us mothers and fathers. Because even if your biological was not in your life, God has given you spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers. And they've gotten instruction. And they're instructing you and teaching you. And you got to see yourself learning. And don't think you can't learn. Don't let folk trick you into thinking you can't learn. You know how I know you can learn? Because God is never going to tell you to do something you can't do. He, he said, listen, don't neglect the instruction of your, of your mother. That means that you can handle instruction. You can handle teaching. But you got to see yourself learning. You got to see yourself being educated. You got to see yourself being intelligent. You, you, you got to see yourself uh, being smart. You, 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 you got to be able to perceive it for yourself. Because some folk will look at you as a black male and immediately think you don't know nothing and can't learn anything. No, you got to see it for yourself. Because here it is. The lack of education leads to incarceration. Son, please hear what I'm getting across to you today. The lack of education leads to incarceration. Here's what I mean by that. It is one thing that most men in prison have in common. And I mean black, white, red, purple, yellow, whatever color they are. One thing most of those men have in common. The lack of education. Most of them have dropped out of high school. Because that lack of education is what led them into incarceration. Because here's what happens. And, and this, this country knows this far too well. That when you enter into the third grade and you can't read. The authorities put a bed in the prison for you. That's how they determine how big prisons are. That's how they determine how many beds go into jail. By the reading skills or lack thereof of those in the third grade. So when you was in third grade and you couldn't read, they put a, a, a bed in prison for you. And one out of every three black males is going to end up spending some time in prison. But that don't have to be you. And one of the ways to prevent that is education. Because if you got education, you got some kind of training, some kind of knowledge, somebody will pay you for that. People run up to me all the time, Pastor, can you help me get a job? Well, what can you do? I don't know. Nobody pays for that. Nobody, I don't know anybody. I know a lot of people, but I don't know anybody that will pay you for, I don't know. You got to learn something. You got to get something in your head. And the fact that you're not being educated and not learning is not always the teacher's fault. 
Sometimes, son, it's your fault that if you bring it home D's and F's, sometimes it's your fault. Because you up late all night playing electronic games under the cover when you ought to be asleep. Now you're too tired to learn in the classroom. Sometimes it's your fault. Showing up late for class and trying to sneak out early and cutting class with friends. Sometimes it's your fault that you're not learning anything. Get home from school and rather go straight to doing your homework. You grab a basketball and run to the park, never getting your work done. Sometimes it's your fault when you're not learning anything. You sitting in the back of the classroom in the corner, knowing you can't see or hear. Move to the front so you can concentrate without being distracted. Sometimes it's your fault. Not doing the work, not turning it in. When you do turn it in, you don't turn it in on time. Sometimes it's your fault. Sometimes it is on you. Sometimes it ain't the teacher. She don't like me and the principal don't like me and they racist over there. And Sometimes it ain't them. Sometimes it's you. Because the thing is, if you just show up every day, you'll get a D. Just every day, go to class, that's a D. Turn in every assignment on time, that's a C. Put forth some energy and effort to do your best, that's an A and a B. That ain't on the teacher, that's on you. But then I admit, sometimes it ain't on you. Sometimes your lack of learning is on the teacher. It's on a system. It's on their lack of respect for who you are. Sometimes it ain't you. Sometimes when you walk in the classroom as a black male, they see less than who you are. So they have these low expectations of you. So they don't teach you at a high level. They, they don't think you can get it, so they never bring it to you. Sometimes it ain't you. That, that here you are, the teacher gives you a test, supposed to take 45 minutes to take it. You get it done in 30 because you're brilliant. And there you got 15 minutes with nothing to do. So what you start doing, fidgeting, talking to your friend, messing around and all of that. Now the teacher sending you down to the principal. No, you go to the principal and learn a plan on what to do with brilliant children. Why am I sitting here for 15 minutes? Because I finished before everybody else. What's the next assignment? What else do you have for me? What's for extra credit? Sometimes it ain't on you. Sometimes it's the system. Here you are able to learn ocular or you're able to learn de demonstratively using hands and all that. But every day they teach you with a lecture. Sometimes it ain't on you. To have 35 students in a classroom and all children don't learn the same way but you all being taught one way sometime it ain't on you sometime it's not you that when they talk about world history when they deal with white children they start with them and their descendants as kings and queens in Europe then when they deal with world history with you as a black they start with you as a slave in America and then here they start with white children positive as kings and queens and praise God for that then you get a positive outcome but then you start negative with my sons and expect for them to be positive when well, you're starting off negative sometime it ain't on you if you're gonna do world history and start with kings and queens in Europe then go on back to kings and queens in Africa sometime it ain't on you 12 months of white history two hours in February on black history sometime it ain't you man one of one of the most difficult because here's here's what you gotta understand you can still be a good student in a bad system you, you can be a good student with a bad teacher. Talking about he don't like me or she don't like me. Well, baby, use that for fuel. If they don't like you, they don't think you can learn. No, I'm going to prove to you how smart I am. How you going to give me a, 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 a test that you admit is culturally biased. You give me a standardized test that you admit is culturally biased. After I give you my answers, you tell me something wrong with my intellect. Wait a minute. It cannot be intellectual. You've already admitted it's cultural. But you judging me based on intellect when you ought to be helping understand that this is about culture. 
it ain't always on you but you cannot let the fact that somebody ain't good to keep you from overcoming bad you got to see yourself learn it can happen it can happen well you know somebody say well you know college ain't for everybody college ain't for everybody and and prison teaches us that college ain't for everybody you ain't got to argue that with me son I know that college ain't for everybody, but I ain't talking about everybody. I'm talking about you. You got to see yourself learning. You got to get something in your head. I, I told my four sons, I said, listen, y'all need to be making straight A's. Y'all coming here with B's and C's and you my son. Y'all need to be making straight A's. I did. My genes are in you. You need to be making straight A's. I said that in front of my, I guess one of my sons came home with some bad grades or something, and I went off in front of my family and all that kind of stuff, and some of them pulled me to the side. Well, Jeffrey, you know, uh, everybody ain't going to be like you. Everybody ain't going to make straight A's. I ain't talking about everybody. I'm talking about these four right here. That's the ones I'm talking about. I know college ain't for everybody, but that don't mean college ain't for you. Stop letting people convince you what you cannot do. You can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. You can learn. You can be educated. You can do it. My, I, my, my third son, Jalen. Man, I'll tell you this about Jalen. Well, let me, before I do Jalen, let me do this. Let me say this. That you will never be able to learn when you think you already know everything. That's why it says, listen to the instruction. Well, if I don't listen, I can't learn. And when I think I already know everything, then I'm not listening. You cannot ignore teachers and ignore assignments and ignore mentors and ignore coaches and ignore neighbors and ignore everything and everybody. Ignore all that and somehow think you're going to learn. No. And here's the thing about it. When you walk in a classroom, you already know what you know. Right? When I walk in the classroom, I already know what I know. Now, I may not know what the professor knows. If I'm in a seminar or workshop, I don't need to be the one doing all the talking. Why? Because I already know what I know. But I may not know what the presenter knows. So I need to sit down and shut up and listen to what somebody else is saying. Because you cannot learn without listening. When, when uh, at the end of slavery, 1863, blacks were released from slavery in America. And, and it was against the law to teach blacks how to read. Our four parents, it was against the law to teach them how to read. And some of the majority culture began to call them ignorant. They're ignorant. They can't read. They're ignorant. They can't write. And, and they begin to call us ignorant. Because here's the thing. It was against the law for them to go to school. So here was a group of people that had a desire for education and no opportunity. Fast forward 21st century. All kind of opportunities. What we don't have is the desire. And they called our foreparents ignorant. And y'all, the base word for ignorant is ignore. They were not ignoring the teaching. They were uninformed. They were never informed about it because it was against the law to teach them. So they were not ignorant. There's a difference between being ignorant and uninformed. Fast forward 21st century. We're not uninformed. We're ignorant because we ignore those that God has put in our life to teach us. You cannot learn if you do not listen. And you can even succeed in a failing school. You can, you, you can be a good student in a bad system. Now, here's the thing. My, my, my third son, Jalen, he's a very unique person. Nobody else like Jalen. And uh, Jalen had a terrible high school career. Terrible. Jalen, one of the most difficult things for me to have done in my life was to get my number three son through high school. One of the most difficult things. I mean difficult. I mean, and mind you, I graduated from high school, I graduated from college, I went to graduate school, I built a hundred churches, I planted people, I, I mean, I, all of that, right? I've had cancer. But one of the most difficult things in my life, 
was to get that boy through high school. I mean, teachers call and son, I don't want to talk to a teacher lest I call to do not have a teacher call me. Teachers calling me. Now, we at school with this big old table. Got teachers and educators and psychiatrists and counselors and principals and, and me. Because this boy is, terrorizes his teachers. Son, stop terrorizing your teachers. So I'm thinking, okay, but maybe he has a learning disability. So I took him, got all those tests and all that kind of stuff. This boy, he scores off the chart on the test. Son, why are you doing this? Man, you can do the work. You can handle You've proven that. He would come home reading books this thing. He's reading Moby Dick and Sherlock Holmes and Tale of Two Cities and stuff you and I wouldn't go to a bookstore and get. But these are not the assignments for the class. This is just stuff he wants to read on his own. Because he wasn't interested in what they were teaching and how they were teaching it. And it took everything I had to get this boy through high school. So much so that I had already planned that, that money I set aside for his education. I was going to buy me a house in Florida. Man, you don't want to go to college? Fine. Get me a home in Florida. And after he got out of high school, do you know there was a college that let this boy in? I ain't playing. I'm shocked. Somebody let this boy in school? Jalen is, is on course to graduate a year and a half early. He makes straight A's and B's. He calls me. I don't know if I'm going to go to graduate school in New York or go to graduate school in Chicago. All I'm trying to tell you is sometimes it ain't you. But when you understand what is going on, you got to wake up and get what you need to get so that you can get to the next level. My friend, Dr. Kevin Cosby. Cosby, Dr. Cosby is so awesome. He pastors uh, St. Stephen's Church in Louisville, Kentucky and in Jeffersonville, uh, Indiana. He's their one church in two states. That's how awesome he is. And he's the president of Simmons College. And he said, he was telling a group of people, he said, listen, you got to get your brain together. You, you got you to get your brain right. Now, here's why that's important. I'll get on what, what Kevin said. But here's why it's important to get your brain together. Because somehow, son, you keep thinking people are afraid of you. They're afraid of you. Why? Because you walk around with your behind showing in your pants. Your hair looking crazy. You don't know how to dress yourself. Dropped out of school and dealing drugs on a street corner. Talking about this block right here. This is mine right here. Never been outside your neighborhood. And you think somehow folk are afraid of you. Nobody is afraid of that. There's a man in the Bible in the New Testament. And he, had, he was filled with evil spirits. He would cut himself, he would break chains, run up into the mountains, come back down, sleeping in the cemetery because he liked hanging out with dead people and being in dead environments. I mean, he was nuts and crazy. He wouldn't comb his hair. He was, he'd take his clothes off in an inappropriate place and all of that. And but nobody afraid of him. Nobody. Then he met Jesus. And when he met Jesus, the Bible said he was clothed in his right mind, sitting at the feet of Jesus. And the Bible said, and the people were afraid. Because ain't nobody afraid when you butt naked in the wrong places, hurting yourself, cutting yourself, won't leave your neighborhood, and hanging out in dead places. They are not afraid of you at the crack house. They are afraid of Barack Obama at the White House. Because when he walk out, he got his stuff together, got his walk, and know how to talk and communicate. Now that's who they're afraid of. Kevin Cosby. Kevin Cosby said, you got to get your brain together. Because ain't nobody going to take you serious till you get your brain straight. And he brought up uh, the Wizard of Oz. In the Wizard of Oz, there was a scarecrow, and nobody took the scarecrow. Nobody, nobody took him seriously. Nobody. Not even the crows. <laughs> crows would fly on him, land on him, pick on him. Now, he's a scarecrow. He's supposed to be scaring the crows away. They just landing on him, sitting on him, messing with him, because nobody took him serious. And he finally realized why nobody takes me serious. He said, if I only had a brain. 
and he finally said you know what I got to get a brain and he decided that I'm going to the Emerald City and I'm going to get a brain and so here's what he did he got off the stick and got on the road to going to get his brain and on this journey on the journey to going to get his brain he, he finally dawned on him that I got something to offer I got some intellect he was getting his brain together on the way to getting his brain together because remember the scarecrow came up with all the ideas on the road to Emerald City he was the one that came up with the ideas on how to deal with a wicked witch he's the one that came up with an idea on what to do with the witch's broom he's the one that came up with the idea on how to deal with flying monkeys because he got off the stick got on the right road discovered I got something going on in my head when he got to Emerald City they made him the mayor of Emerald City I'm trying to tell you son soon as you get off the stick or pipe or whatever it is you own and get on the right road you'll learn that you got something to offer you gotta see yourself learning last thing last thing you gotta start seeking life life is about choices verse 10 Proverbs 1 and 10 my son if sinners entice you, turn your back on them. They may say, come, join us. Let's hide and kill someone just for fun. Let's ambush the innocent. Let's swallow them alive like the grave. Let's swallow them whole like those who go down to the pit of death. Think of great things we'll get. We'll fill our houses with all the stuff we take. Come throw in your lot with us. We'll all share the loot. Sound like gang activity, don't it? That's what it is. It's organized crime in the street. And Solomon says, when, when sinners entice you to come join their gang, come hook up with us. And we can kill people and steal from people. And we'll organize this crime. And you bring what you got in and I bring what I got in. And then we'll split it up. And he says, when that happens, just turn your back on them. Just don't do it. Just walk away from them. No, here it is, Nancy Reagan. Just say no. In the early 80s, when, when drugs were on the rise in America and all that, we got a drug czar and a war against drugs and all these officers. Are, and Nancy Reagan had the best idea on how to deal with drugs. Just say no. Because here's the thing, Dr. James Dobson says that teenagers, 15, 16 year olds, they, can, they don't have the psychological capacity to evaluate consequences. A 15, so we tell them, don't do it because this will happen to you. Well, they don't have the psychological capacity to be able to assess that. That if I steal, they don't have the capacity to understand that I can go to juvenile center and I can have a strike against me. I can get put out of school, that I'm going to have to drop out. What impact it's going to have on my mother? They don't have the capacity to do that. That if I have sex with this girl, that I could get a, a, a sexually transmitted disease or unwanted pregnancy or mess her life up or mess my life up. Now I got a baby. I don't even have a house. I don't even have a job. Now I got to take this baby to my mama. They don't have the psychological capacity to assess consequences. That if, if I kill this person, what I'm doing to the person, what I'm doing to their family, what I'm doing to my community, they don't have the psychological capacity to do that. But even if you don't have the psychological capacity to understand dropping out is wrong and drugs is wrong and, 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 and hitting people upside the head and gang activity is wrong, you have the capacity to discern right from wrong. I don't have the capacity to deal with consequences, but I got the capacity to make the right choice because God has given me his wisdom. And if it doesn't line up to what God's word says, then I know I don't need to be doing it and just say no to drugs, just say no to alcohol, say no to promiscuity, say no to pornography, say no to gang violence, say no to dealing drugs. All you got to do is just say no. Moses said, I set before you life and death. Choose life that you might live. Y'all, that's what it's all about. You got a choice to make. And ain't but two choices. Is life or death? Is Jesus or Satan? Is heaven or hell? Ain't but two choices. And you have the capacity, maybe not to deal with consequences, but I know right from wrong. And I'm going to trust God that if I do what's right, God will handle my consequences. 
why would why would at risk boys get caught up in gang violence why would they do that why wouldn't they why wouldn't they choose god over gangs and work over stealing and choose victory over violence and choose liberty over bondage and choose liberation over incarceration and choose peace over confusion and choose love over hate and choose heaven over hell choose salvation over death choose loving somebody to life rather than beating somebody to death saying no to peer pressure why is that why would an at-risk boy want to join a gang here's what the experts say it's about belonging it's about respect it's about money it's about protection so our at-risk boys and they're enticed to come join why because i i need a i need some connectivity i need family i need belonging i didn't get it with my family so i got to try to find it somewhere else it's it's about respect nobody respects me nobody honors me even my teachers look down upon me at times my community doesn't think anything about me they think I'm less than human even in our constitution and I need somewhere I can get some respect so they go to a gang for protection I need somebody to have my back because where I live and my parents aren't there and all of this I need some money I'm tired of being poor I gotta eat I gotta take get clothes I gotta, and this is the way I'm gonna do it and son I'm trying to tell you you don't have to go that direction there are other people, same risk you have, same issue, same family thing and all that. They didn't choose gangs. Some chose clubs. They, I, you can get a sense of belonging, get some protection, get, get some family situations. Some chose clubs. Some, some choose sports. Basketball, football, all of that team aspect and learning discipline, all that. Some choose, they chose fraternities. That's why they call them, that's my frat brother. They get all that stuff. Well, I chose a church. I get all that from church. I get family and connectivity and belonging. That's why we call each other Brother Johnson and Sister Smith. I got it from the church. I got the protection from, from my relationship with God. The next chapter says that God is my shield. And I know God has got my back. And, and, and the money piece, I ain't got to worry about that. Because God knows how to pay bills. God... God knows how to find tuition money. God knows how to start businesses. And God knows that I ain't sweating none of that. I got all that with God. You don't have to turn your life into gangs and violence and drug addiction and ignorance and stupidity and lack of education. Here's the last thing. Verse 18 says, and, and when they do this, when they get caught up in that stuff, they think they're setting a trap for other folk. Said, no, you're not setting a trap for other folk. They setting a trap for themselves. When they assault others and they beat others down, they steal from others, and they think, yeah, we set this trap for them. No, it's a trap for yourself. You reap what you sow. Life has a boomerang effect. What you throw out comes back at you. It, you you're really hurting yourself with that. Let me close it like this. Uh, I went to see the movie Looper. Looper, Looper, with Bruce Willis. I don't know if the time was 2044 or 3044, but Bruce Willis gets in a time machine, the old Bruce Willis, and comes back 30 years to confront the past Bruce Willis. Yeah, because everything the past Bruce Willis is doing is affecting the future Bruce Willis. And so the future Bruce Willis, he already know what's going to happen, so he came back to the past to have a conversation with himself. And the first thing he communicated to himself is when you find yourself in this particular situation, run as far away as you can. So that situation came. The old Bruce Willis went by to see if the young Bruce Willis had listened and run away and saw him get ready to get in that situation. And he said, didn't I tell you to run? Then he sat across himself at a cafe, the old Bruce Willis, talking to the young Bruce Willis and said, you idiot. Didn't I tell you to run? Everything you're doing now is affecting you in the future. You know what? I was watching, I was thinking, I wish I had a time machine. Because I want to go back to the, talk to the 20-year-old Jeffrey Johnson 
And I want to tell him that when you see this certain situation, run. When you see this person come and run. When you see this type of environment, run. When this woman walks up on you, run! I want to go back and tell 20-year-old Jeffrey John, you idiot! Everything you're doing in the past affecting me right now. You're hurting yourself. And then here's what the, the old Bruce Willis from the future told his young self. He said, you know what? As messed up as you are, you're going to meet somebody and they're going to save your life. And he said, well, what's their name? He said, don't worry about what their name is. Worry about why. Why would they save you? You ain't nothing but a liar, a cheater. This is what he told his young self. You ain't nothing but a killer and a murderer, a drug addict and an alcoholic. You worrying about what their name is. No, why would they save you? He said, but they saved you anyway. Here's my word to somebody who's, whose past has messed you up. You made bad decisions and wrong choices. I'm telling you, there's somebody that'll save your life. And the question you need to ask is why would they save somebody like me? I've lied, I've cheated, I've stolen, I've murdered, I've assaulted, I've gotten high, I've had children that I didn't take care of, all of that. Why would they do it? And I ain't going to do you like Bruce Willis. I'm going to tell you the name of the one that will save you. And his name is Jesus. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that your word is going to go forth and be hidden in the hearts and the heads of men and women. I pray that somebody will understand that what they're doing in the present is impacting their future. That forgiveness is available to them in the name of Jesus. Thank you for saving drug addicts and dope heads and crackheads and thugs. Thank you for saving those who made mistakes and errors by the name of Jesus Christ and his blood. Lord, I pray that somebody's going to get right with you. It, it all starts with you, God. And I pray that they'll realize they'll never get to where they're supposed to be till they get it right with you. And I'm believing it done right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you can stand.